Amen. All right, so Revelation chapter 13, obviously a real famous Revelation chapter that talks about the beast and the mark of the beast and the number of his name. That's where he gets 666 from. And, you know, there's a lot of people who, even outside of Christianity, just, just people in general in the world, have heard like 666, the number of the beast, and all this other stuff. It's, it's, it's just really popular. It's really just, just kind of common knowledge these days. And you'll have a lot of you know, music groups and other people who just think it's really cool. Like anything that looks satanic or evil is just real cool. And they, they put up all these symbols and they'll have the 666. And um, it's just, it's kind of common knowledge. Another thing that's kind of commonly known among many Christians is that during the end times, there's going to be a one world government, a one world currency, and a one world religion. And this is something that even if people don't know where it's found in the Bible other than like, well, Revelation, just because that's like all the end time stuff. People just kind of have this general knowledge of that. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing to have this knowledge. But we're going to dig in depth a little bit about that. And, and just I'm going to show you here in Revelation 13 that this is where you could find just in this one chapter all three of those things, the one world government, the one world currency, and the one world religion. It's important that what we believe is obviously something that is found in the Bible and you see for yourself that it's there. You know, just like 666, just because everybody, you know, quote unquote, knows that, you should know why it is the way it is. Because what happens is people have a tendency to be flippant about certain things that you say, oh, this is, that's common knowledge. Oh, yeah, everybody knows that. And like 666, for example. But what does that really mean? You know, what is, what's really going to happen? And here it says that it is, um, in verse 18, Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. So it's saying, we get a little bit of information that most people don't even realize that it's the number of a man. And there's a reason why that's in the Bible. It's important. And again, I'm not going to get in depth into the name or anything. My point is just that when you kind of be when you're flippant about things just in general from the Bible and you say, "Oh yeah, well that's just common knowledge." Yeah, of course there's going to be this one world government and all this other stuff. You would start to you might start to conjure up ideas that are not necessarily biblical just because you've heard this over and over again, and people will start to to think, "Well, how are things going to be?" Um, with a one world government or with a currency. And honestly, the thing about the currency, it, there's not necessarily going to be physical money. It doesn't really say that. It just says there's a restriction on buying and selling. It doesn't, it doesn't say there's going to be one like, like dollar, right? It just says that, they, that if you don't have the mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell. So, um, and we can look at here, look at down at verse number, um, verse number seven. Well, at first, let's look at verse number 16, because we're right there anyways. Verse number 16, it says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So the Bible's telling us here, well, okay, you're not going to be able to buy or sell anything unless you have this mark. You're not going to be able to conduct commerce. So does that mean there's necessarily going to be one currency? No. But it does mean you're going to be restricted on being able to buy and sell anything. And uh, the reason why people say it's one currency, I think, is just because, well, how can you restrict buying and selling unless you're only allowed to use one format, one type of currency. Um, but with technology these days, who knows how they're going to control that. You know, it may or may not be a currency. So just because you hear these things like, oh, there's going to be this and there's going to be that, don't just, when you read it in the Bible, overlook it. You know, everything we ought, we ought to make sure that we're trying to get as much understanding as possible from what the book actually says and not just from what we've heard and has become second nature for us. So um, jump back to verse number seven here in Revelation 13. I'm going to point this out real quick. It says, this is, this is talking about the one world government that will happen. It says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And, and keep a lot of these passages in mind because we're going to go to other um, prophecies and other scripture and 
I've pulled out a lot of a lot of verses that we're going to be looking at, and I want you to notice the similarities and, the, co and the, the commonalities between these as we go through them tonight. And try to stay up with me. This isn't going to be the most dynamic sermon I've ever preached. It's a lot more of a Bible study on end times events, but I think these things are all important to learn. We're going to learn more about the, the, the world religion of the New World Order. Because that's what's, that's what's happening. And we need to be aware of these things as they're happening around us. Just because as the days get closer, we need to know what's going on. We need to know where we're headed. Obviously, we need to be prepared. We know that the Antichrist is coming. We know that there's going to be a great tribulation. But we need to understand as, as, as much as we possibly can about the events that are going to be leading up to this and happening so that we are prepared as these things start to unfold. We already know what's going to happen. We know the game plan. And knowing what's going to happen gives you a huge advantage. So just try to stick with me tonight. Again, I, I apologize if... if, if it gets boring. Hopefully it's not boring for you and we can just follow along. We're going to be doing a lot of digging into Daniel tonight and, and how Daniel relates to Revelation with what we're reading here. So in verse number 7 it says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. So here we see the one world government because this, the, the Antichrist has power that's given him over everybody, every language, every nation. He is, is in charge and rules over basically the entire world, everybody. And then it says, everybody that dwells upon the earth, so that's the entire earth, the entire worldwide, shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So every unsaved person is going to... Well, Every person whose name is not found in the book of life is going to worship the beast. And, um, you know, the Bible talks a lot about people when they become reprobate, their name being removed from the Lamb's book of life. And I preached an entire sermon about that. It's a real interesting topic. And um, I would recommend listening to that, but also just doing your own study. Anytime the, the, the book of life or the Lamb's book of life is mentioned in the Bible, look that up because it's really interesting to see that you, you never see people's names being added in there. You only see people's names being removed. And I believe that's because God wants everybody to be saved. So everybody's name starts off in that book of life. But the Bible is also clear in Revelation, especially in Revelation 14. I don't think we're getting there tonight that anyone who takes the mark of the beast, their name, they're going to hell. For sure. So their name is blotted out of the book of life. And we see that here in Revelation 13, verse 8, that everyone on the whole earth whose names are not written in the book of life, so they've, they've been blotted out, they're going to worship him because they're going to take that mark of the beast. So in taking the mark of the beast, they worship him and they seal their own fate. And again, this is important to understand because... We don't know how far into this we will be. We don't, I mean, maybe it'll happen in our lifetimes, maybe not. I think it will. That's my opinion on the matter. I don't know that for a fact. No one can prove to you that this is, you know, that this will happen in our lifetime. But it's important to know because if if the if the mark is something visible, if you can see that, there's no hope for that person. You don't want to have you're not going to want to have any communication with someone who's already taken the mark of the beast because they're reprobate. You aren't going to be able to get them saved and all that's going to happen is they're going to bring persecution on you. So you're not going to want to have anything to do with people who've already taken the mark of the beast. Because at this point, the persecution's already going to be coming against the Christians and you're going to be you know, in your own struggles and battles and fights and everything else. There's not going to be any need to, to get involved with a reprobate. Yeah. You're not going to get them saved and they're, they're just going to be out to kill you. So um, it's, a, again, another reason why it's important to keep these things in mind. And... God has given us ample warning and information for us to know that going into these events, we could, we could already know this stuff. So st stick with me. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17. We're going to see how the... Basically, it's how the Antichrist comes into power and, and how the kingdoms... Because we ought to be able to see these things start to happen as well. There's, there's a lot of signs that we're going to be able to, to witness if, assuming everything happens in our lifetime, we'll be able to see these things happening because they're happening on a global scale. We're talking about kingdoms here. 
we're talking about global government. We're talking about wars where um, there are specific kingdoms mentioned. So if you're in Revelation 17, look at verse number 7. It says, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. And keep that in mind, especially the ten horns. This is going to be recurring over and over again. Um, the ten horns we're going to see come up again in Daniel. And just, just to be clear, too, we're starting in the New Testament for a reason. When we look at prophecy, when we look at Scripture, the New Testament, the revelation, means it's been revealed. When we go back to Daniel, I don't know if I have it in my notes to actually read that part, but basically God tells Daniel to seal up these things. And those things are sealed up. So the prophecies that we see in the book of Daniel are darker. They're not as clear. It's not, you know, when they were given to Daniel, there's a lot less understanding of what's going to happen in the end times, which is why he gave us the revelation of Jesus Christ. He revealed a lot more unto us. So what we're starting with Revelation and, you know, um, 2 Thessalonians to, to see the clearer picture to help us to understand what was the Old Testament talking about in the book of Daniel. What was the scripture talking about? So um, we're starting here to, to try to get as, as founded as possible uh, and looking and taking note of these things before we head back to the Old Testament. So Revelation 17, 7 says, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen and one is and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So, we see here, again, the reference to the ten kings. Now, we, I, we also see the seven kings. I'm not going to focus as much on that because that's not mentioned as much in the, in the Old Testament. But we see here, again, the, the, the ten kings that here it says they haven't really received a kingdom yet, but they're given all of their power unto the beast. And um, they have one mind. They're all going to have the same goal. They're all going to have the same um, focus and they're going to give all their power and strength unto the beast to, to basically have this worldwide dominion. Flip back, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians 2 and then we're going to flip back to Daniel 7 and we're going to spend a lot of time in Daniel. 2 Thessalonians 2 says that you be not soon shaken in mind in verse number 2 or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Again, another event that we're going to be able to see before we're ever, before Jesus Christ even comes back to rapture us out of this world. These things are going to happen. That's why he says, look, I don't want anyone to deceive you. I don't want anyone to trick you. Don't be shaken in mind. Don't be troubled. Don't, don't worry. Don't have people try to tell you that the day of Christ is at hand until you start to see these things happen, until you see that the, the, the son of perdition is revealed. And he will be revealed. We'll understand that. We'll know that when it actually happens. He says, first, there's going to be a falling away. 
which there's a lot of apostasy in, in Christianity today of people just getting away from God's word, the simple basic truths, not believing what it says, just falling away. And then it says that man of sin is going to be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all is called God. So when you see a guy coming into power and he's exalting himself just above every God, because that's what it says. He says, above all that is called God. So it doesn't matter what religion people are. He's going to say, I'm above all of them. I'm above anything that's called God. He'll be exalting himself. He says, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He's going to claim to be God incarnate. And he's going to sit in the temple showing himself that he's God. This is a very clear indication that um, things are going to get really bad really quick for us <laughs> when we see these things come to pass. But don't let, he said, don't let anyone, um, you know, worry you is that the day of Christ is ahead. Turn back to Daniel chapter 7 now. We're going to spend probably the rest of the evening in Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7 is where, you know, the first six book of Daniel we have a lot, of, um, a lot of great stories. you got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel in the lion's den. Um, we see with Nebuchadnezzar. But Daniel 7 is where these, these prophecies start. And they, and they go through the whole, pretty much the whole rest of the book of Daniel. He, he sees these visions. And a lot of them are, are explained to him as well. But you remember in Revelation, the, the ten kings, because that's going to come up again when we look at these. Revelation 7, verse number 3 says, And four great beasts came up from the sea, divers one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said, Thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. So again, we see ten horns on this beast, just like the ten horns we saw in the, in the beast of Revelation chapter 13. And in verse number 8, it says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom... There were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. <clears throat> and this is where we see the Antichrist comes from those three kings. Now, um, there's a lot of people that have theories you know, about the lion and the bear and the leopard representing different nations today. And they're constantly looking for um, applications of, of current events to apply to prophecy and say, oh, see, look, this is happening it's because Russia's doing this and Russia's the bear and you see all these other things. I don't, I don't think we could take it that far. I don't, I don't think you could, you could know that because there's going to be wars and rumors of wars up until these things actually start to happen. But it's not going to be any concrete thing. So when you see, you know, Russia or, or Iran or whoever, you know, Britain, you know, whoever people think that these, um, these animals represent, I don't get too caught up in that because those are the, the other three beasts that are mentioned in Daniel 7, but it's the fourth beast is the one that we really got to pay attention to because that's the one where the Antichrist is coming from. And... That's the one that has the ten kings. And we're going to see here, because he explains in, in verse 17 that these great beasts that we just read about in the beginning of Daniel 7, it says in verse 17, these great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So the, the beasts that are represented, the lion, 
the the bear the leopard and then the, the fourth beast that's that wasn't like any of them iron teeth and everything else he says those are four kings which shall rise out of the earth and then jump down to verse 23 it says thus he said the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces so here we see um, this is where the focus is on anyways is on that fourth beast that fourth kingdom that says it's going to devour the earth and tread it down and break it in pieces um, we're going to see a lot of destruction coming from that fourth kingdom, from that fourth beast. And it says in verse 24, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Um, so much to be covered here, but um, <clears throat> we see this lines up perfectly with Revelation. Revelation really helps us understand this because at verse 25, the, that horn that comes up that subdues the other three, that is the Antichrist. And it says that he's going to speak great words against the Most High. He's going to speak blasphemies. And obviously, this is the one that's going to be proclaiming himself to be God. He's going to be blaspheming God. And it says, he shall wear out the saints. That wear out means he's going to be going after them and, and, and waging war and killing the saints. He's going to be killing those that believe on Christ. And that's what it means when it says he's going to wear them out. And it says he's going to think to change times and laws. He's going to want to change everything. You know, our, the calendar, times, laws, every, he's like, okay, you know, I'm God, I'm here, we're going to make some serious changes. And he's going he's gonna to try to change everything up from times to laws. It says, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Now that word time is singular and then times is plural. So if you have one time, times is going to be two and then the dividing of time, cutting it in half, would be... Um, one plus two plus a half is three and a half. So it's going to be basically three and a half years that the Antichrist is going to be in charge in going after the Christians and doing all, doing all the things that he does. He's going to have that, um, that power and that authority definitely for the first three and a half years or um, <clears throat> for, from the time that, he, that he's put in place for about three and a half years. What we could see here in Daniel 7, 25. Jump back up to verse number 19 of Daniel 7. It says, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. When these end times come and the, and the Antichrist is, is waging war, he is going to be killing the saints. Like, we know and we have faith that God can save us out of any problems. God can protect us. But we also need to understand that we know when, this, when the Antichrist is waging war against the saints, he's going to be killing and prevailing against everyone. And if, if God didn't cut that time short for the elect's sake, he would get everybody. Yeah. It's going to happen. Okay, he's, he is going to come and, and just start killing everyone. And we need to know that, yes, we need to have that faith. And you know what? Maybe you will be one of the ones that, that, that will make it alive and until the coming of Christ, but I mean, odds are probably not. Just in general, and we need to be prepared to be able to face something like that, and and be ready, knowing that hey, the war is going to come when the Antichrist is in power, and he's going to be coming after Christians, and you need to stand firm unto the end, knowing that it very well would probably lead to your death, and. Um,
that devotion is, is going to earn you great rewards in heaven. Verse number 22, it says, until the ancient of days came. So it said, just to get back in context, I'll read it back from 21 again. I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So here we see that the ancient of days, that's when Jesus Christ comes back. That's when God comes and, um, and cuts short that time as the Antichrist is prevailing against the saints. As these things are happening, God cuts that time short. And um, as it says in Matthew 24, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. And um, they are cut, cut short. He said, but for the elect's sake, they, um, those days shall be cut short. Uh, flip over to Daniel chapter 8 because I believe that Daniel chapter 8 now it's a separate vision. Daniel 7 he sees a vision of the four beasts and then he sees the ten horns on, that, on the last beast. The ten horns represent the ten kings and then we also see the, the one horn emerging out of three horns. So like the one, the, the Antichrist is who that is emerging out of like from, from three other kings he kind of takes over the three and, and becomes, you know, the head guy. And um, the, he's the one that speaks the great blasphemies against God and, um, and is leading the charge and basically has the power over the entire world. Daniel 8, I believe, is a, uh, a repeat in, a, in another vision, but the same prophecy. And I don't think that's very difficult to believe that that's the case. I don't think it's, it's, it's a separate, completely different time or event that it's talking about. Even within the book of Daniel, you see other prophecies when, when Daniel's interpreting the dreams. When he says, you know, the, 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 the vision or the dream is one. When Nebuchadnezzar had two different dreams, they were both talking about the same event. And he said that it happened twice because God is telling you that this is for sure. This is going to happen. And, um, or that was with uh, Joseph. Right? You remember Joseph in prison and, and he, he um, was able to, to tell that there was going to be the seven years of plenty and then the seven years of famine and the, the visions were the same. Um, God has a tendency to do that and I believe it's the same thing here in Daniel that we see the same vision just or the same prophecy within two different visions. Look at verse number 8 of Daniel 8. It says, therefore the he-goat, and we're, we're skipping over some of these prophecies because I'm only focusing kind of on, the, on the, the details about the kingdoms and the kings. And there would be too much to read all of these chapters during service. So let's look at verse number 8. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the hosts of heaven. And it cast down some of the hosts of, and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it casteth down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall the vision, be, shall, shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And what we're seeing here is the, um, the, the abomination of desolation being set up and taking away the daily sacrifice. What's going to happen is the, the temple in Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt and there's gonna, they're going to resume the daily sacrifices before the, before the Antichrist comes because he's going to then take away that daily sacrifice and um, it said that that's what the prophecy is saying is that when he comes he's going to take away the daily sacrifice which isn't happening now so we, we know that it's going to have to come and he's going to be standing in the temple 
showing himself that he is God. And that temple isn't around today. Now, what some Christians will do, or what some, especially the Zionists will do, like, well, we want to bring in the kingdom. So we want to get make sure that that temple gets built as soon as possible and everything else because we want this prophecy to be fulfilled. And that's just foolish. Because what you're saying then is just saying, let's, let's just bring in the Antichrist. Like, the reason why they say that is because they think that when they do that, like Jesus Christ is going to come back immediately and just scoop them up. Not realizing, no, you're going to be going through a lot of, a lot of problems and, and a lot of hardship, a lot of persecutions and a great tribulation when that happens. And um, I don't know about you, I'm not just like itching to go through great tribulation. You know, I, if it doesn't happen in our lifetime, great. You know, I, I, hopefully I'm trying to strengthen my children up. I care about them, what they're going to have to go through. Obviously, we know God is good and God's able to, to, to protect us and do everything. And, and he'll be just about it. You know, I'm not worried about an injustice happening with my children. God is just. He'll make sure that, that things happen appropriately. But, I mean, I don't want to see them go through great tribulation. I, you know, I wouldn't want to. Um, so if it doesn't happen in our lifetime, great. And I'm not going to be doing anything to just make this happen faster. If anything, I want it to be stayed off in our lifetime. Say, hey, let's get some kind of revival going. Let's get people saved. Let's get people aware and, and fight off the wickedness and the evil. And who know, you know, we don't know when this is going to happen. The, the time is appointed already. But I'm going to do whatever I can to, to try to prevent these things from happening. Um, I mean, we know that they will happen, but, but to push it off as far as we possibly can. Look, jump down to verse number 19 of Daniel 8. It says, and he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. So now he's beginning to explain what we just read um, about this vision. He says, so for, the first thing he saw was a ram with two horns. Those are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between the eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, our four kingdoms shall stand up out of, the, out of the nation, but not in his power. So again, we see the reference to four kingdoms, just like we saw the four beasts. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Again, here we're going to see the Antichrist. So we get some more attributes about him. It says he is a king of fierce countenance. That's uh, um, not just angry, but I mean, fierce is um, like it's fierce. It's, <laughs> it's almost like um, someone who's, who has who has an anger and, and and very aggressive. Yeah, and and that's what is you know his face. He's gonna, he's going to have that because he's going to be ready to make war. That's why he's telling us he has a fierce countenance. He is going to be prepared to do battle against the saints. And it says he understands dark sentences. He has a lot of understanding because the devil is very old. You know, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to, he's going to be working in this power. He's going to stand up. It says, and, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. So he's going to be receiving power from someone else, from, the, from Satan. Satan's going to be giving him his power, the, the, the devil. Um, and he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice. Now, when it says practice, I believe it's talking about like practicing witchcraft or practicing magic, that, that these are the things he's going to do because he's going to have lying wonders and deceitfulness to deceive the people. And this is going to be happening through witchcraft. You remember when Moses had the false prophets, what did they do? They were able to perform some of those miracles, but how did they do it? They were wizards. They used witchcrafts. They used enchantments to try to mimic the miracles that Moses did through the power of God. They used their own satanic power to, to duplicate or to mimic these, these, um, these wonders that are going to be done. And that's what, he's gonna, that's what the Antichrist is going to be doing. He's going to have the power of Satan and he's going to understand the dark sentences to do that. He's going to be using his craft to prosper. He says he shall... Um, or at the end of verse 24, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart. So you see the pride. 
He's going to be lifting, him up, lifting himself up, as we saw in 2 Thessalonians 2, above all that is called God. He's going, to be, he's going to be so puffed up and lifted up in his own pride, he's going to proclaim himself to be God. And we see the same exact thing in Daniel 8.25. And look at this, it says, And by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Now, he's going to be destroying people using the, the, the rhetoric of peace. He's going to be saying, he's going to be coming in to bring worldwide peace. And this is why people, one of the, another reason why people are going to eat it up. Because who doesn't want global peace? Who doesn't want to have no more wars? And that's what he's going to sell it as. But by peace, he's going to destroy many. And what he's going to do is say, in order for us to have peace, we need to get rid of these troublemaking Christians who will not obey. They will not take the mark. Look, he's going to say, look, I'm God and I'm here and you can see me. And we got to get rid of these guys who, these unbelievers, these infidels, they're going to have to be wiped out once they're gone. Once these hateful Christians are gone. That, that want to put homosexuals to death, that want to have you know, all these archaic laws from the Bible that they don't even understand. Once these people are gone, now we can have peace. And you know what? I've heard the atheists and the reprobates saying similar things. Mm -hmm. Saying that, well, we need to just get rid of these people because they're the source of all of our problems. You know, how often have you heard, religion is the reason for war? That's what people say. Religion's the reason for war. Without religion, there wouldn't be all these wars and all this other stuff. And they just blame it on religion instead of man's lusts and you know and, and um you know man's wickedness there's blaming on religion or blaming on false religions at that but um this is the mindset of what's going to happen when we're targeted it's going to be you know everyone's going to be against you that that has taken the mark of the beast because they're going to be thinking hey we in order for us in order for the greater good in order for the whole world to have peace these people need to be put to death and they're not going to hesitate to put you to death Flip over to Daniel 11. Daniel 11, we're going to start reading in verse number 22. The Bible says, And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. So when the Antichrist comes into power, one of the ways he's going to do it is... It says he's going to do what his fathers hadn't done. Typically, when you have the you know these these wicked men in power, these kings that that go off to war and they fight, they get all the riches and all the glory and all the honor for themselves. I mean, whatever they're going to be benefited from, the people don't generally get any benefit from the wars. Like when we go to wars, it's these government contractors, the the military industrial con complex that is benefiting from the wars that America goes in, the general, we don't, we don't gain anything. We don't gain freedom yeah. when we go into Iran or Iraq or Afghanistan or any of these places. They're not saving, you know, they're saving us from the cave dwellers that are, that are plotting against the wicked Americans. Yeah, right. I'm not worried about the guys in the Middle East, in the desert, you know, worshiping Allah or whatever they're doing. I'm not worried about them coming here and, and killing us here. So what about 9-11? Look, 9-11 was an inside job. Get over it. Look up the facts and figure it out. But, um, you know, regardless of all of that, <clears throat> where was I going when I went off on that tangent with 9-11? With I was like, I did 9-11 and that's... My whole mind just went blank. But, um, we don't benefit from 
Yeah, we don't, we don't, we're not going to benefit from that war. And the people who benefit are those ones in charge. But what the Antichrist is going to do, thank you, what the Antichrist is going to do is that he's going to scatter them. He's going to scatter the spoil. So the riches that he gets, the prey, the spoil, the riches, it says in verse uh, 24 of chapter 11, he's going to spread that, which his fathers didn't do that. His fathers, fathers no one has done that. But he's going to give that to the people to, to make them appreciate him and be like, oh, man, you know, just like Obama comes in, he promises all this stuff. Oh, I want Obama phone. I want Obamacare. I want, you know, I want, I want you to take care of me completely. And he makes all these promises. And what the Antichrist is going to do, he's going to try to win over the hearts of the people to get into power by saying, okay, yeah, here's some money. Here's some goods. Here's the spoil. We're going to make everything good. You're going you're gonna to be... Um, not have any needs. We're going to have peace. And he's going to sell them this whole list. And it says, He shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Jump down to verse number 28. It says, Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. So before he starts making the war with his saints, this is, this is him coming into power. This is him, you know, um, trying to get the people on his side by, by spreading the spoil. But then it says, he's, his heart shall be against the holy covenant and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do... He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And this is extremely important because this is what's referenced in Matthew 24. Keep your finger in Daniel 11. We're coming right back here. And flip over to Matthew 24. So here we see him with indignation against the Holy Covenant, and he's going to have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So he's going to be in league and in, in dealing with people who hate God. He's going to be dealing with all the God haters out there to, to conjure up a way to basically make war against the saints. And um, what he's going to do then is he's going to pollute the sanctuary. He says, I'm going to, and that's where he's going to go in and set up the abomination of desolation and, and cause the people to worship it and um, remove the daily sacrifice. Look at verse 14 of Matthew 24. This is referenced in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, again, in context, is the disciples asking Jesus, hey, what's going to happen in the end times? What are going to be the signs? What's going to happen at the end of the world? And this is part of Jesus' response. Look at verse 14. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. This is what we just read in Daniel 11. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. We don't need to work. When these things have to come as we don't need to question about when is Christ going to arise, arrive. We'll know it. He's saying, there, you know, when people are saying, oh yeah, Christ is here, Christ is there. Don't believe it. You don't, you won't have to believe it at all because as the lightning shineth from the east and goes to the west, you know, every eye is going to see Jesus Christ's return. We're not going to have to wonder, oh, is that Christ? It'll be evident. We don't need to, he's not coming back secretly. 
He's not coming back to only be seen by a few people. You don't need to ask, oh yeah, I heard that Christ is over there doing miracles. No, it's not. Yeah. That's not going to be Christ. That's going to be an antichrist, a false prophet going around and doing lying wonders and performing these miracles by the power of Satan to deceive people, mm -hmm. to deceive people who, who aren't saved, to deceive the whole world. That's what they're going to be doing. And um, he says specifically in Matthew 24, so when you see that abomination of desolation, because prior to that point, He's going to be in league with intelligence with people who hate God and coming up with his plan. And that's going to be the, the tip off of, of setting everything against the Christians into action. Everyone against God. Because up to that point, you figure things are generally still kind of status quo as far as religion's concerned. Because this is the point where he's proclaimed as God. And this is where he's going to make his decree. And Jesus is saying, okay, when that happens, he's like, don't even, you're on the house up, don't even go into your house. Like, you need to get out of there. Mm -hmm. You need to go now. Like, the time is now to flee. And, and when, when that happens, you don't have any time. You just need to get going. So we need to be aware of this because there's going to come, there's going to come this point, And that is the point where up to that time, you know, people are still practicing religion. They're still doing their daily sacrifices, whatever. You know, no one has said anything against it or, or it's not wrong or illegal for them to do any of that stuff until the Antichrist comes in and says, like, nope, you're not doing this anymore. Guess what? I'm God. I'm in charge. And we're going to need to wipe out the Christians. And that's, this is the warning sign. This is the huge sign that we have been given to understand when those hard times are going to come against us. Flip back, if you would, to Daniel 11. We're going to keep reading where we left off. I'll reread where we were in verse 31. It says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And this is encouraging. I think this is great because in the end time, if we're around for this time, it says, look, the people that do know their God, they're going to be strong. They're going to do exploits. Exploits are going to be doing great works in God's name. We're going to be seeing some great successes even though we might get beheaded or we might get killed or what, you know, whatever is going to happen. It says God's people, people that know their God, they're going to be doing exploits too. And I think that's extremely exciting. Yeah. I don't know what those exploits are going to be, but look at how Christians have been used in times past to, to um, I mean, just the miracles of God that have, that have worked through and around these, these great men in the Bible. And we need to be strong. And I believe we're seeing a strengthening of believers. I believe now we're getting ready and ramped up so that the people that do know their God will be strong. Because I don't think there's a lot of people yet that are that, are that strong. We're, they're not prepared and ready for the, if this day happened today. I think there's very few that would be strong to stand and, and to you know, to be able to stand against the devil and to stand against the Antichrist and to, and to endure the persecutions. But according to the Bible, there's going to be people that are strong and doing exploits. And I think we're seeing a strengthening, uh, a getting back to the roots, getting back to the Bible, getting back to just believing what it says. And there is a movement that's growing. Not even just in this country. You see men who are willing to stand up and say, no, we're going to be uncompromising about this. And you could see just in general, even not amongst Christianity, the polarization that's happening where the wickedness is getting so much worse, which is driving people that much farther away from it and saying, that is wrong. I mean, even amongst like, <laughs> you think of like Republicans and Democrats, they're all, they're all stinking liberal in general. But like, the farther it gets pushed one end, there tends to be people wanting to push back and go even farther the other way. And this is what we see happening. And I think in Christianity, what we're going to end up with is people who are pushing back enough, like we're trying to do, and just be as strong and founded as possible in God's word so that when these things happen, hey, we're going to be ready. I'm going to be ready to do some exploits. I'm going to be ready to, to be speaking my voice 
as loud as possible and preaching the truth. And, you know, if I'm going to end up dying for it, so be it. But glory to God that some people won't compromise and won't back down and will be preaching God's word to the very end. And, um, and, and this is encouraging that there are going to be people of God that are strong and that do exploits for God. Verse number 33, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. So it, so it continues on saying, you know, there are going to be these strong Christians that understand and they're going to be instructing. You know, we're going to be instructing people. If this happens in our lifetime, we're going to be saying, look at all this stuff that's happening. Look, it's happening now. We're going to be instructing people saying, look, you know, if they haven't taken the mark yet to get saved, these things are happening. Everything that the Bible is proclaiming is, is coming to pass. But then it says, um, you know, they're going to be instructing many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. So, we, yeah, we, we will be overcome. But don't lose sight. Don't lose faith. Don't lose hope. We know that this is going to happen. We have this in advance. So just think about and do as much of the good as possible by instructing many until, until your time comes. And if it does until Jesus comes, great. Amen. Praise the Lord. That, that's a, that would be a blessing in itself. But I'm not going to be counting on that happening. I'm going to prepare for the worst. And if we make it, great. And if we don't, well, at least I know about it, and that's what we're going to be planning for. Let's keep reading here. We're almost on verse 34. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And I preached a sermon on flattery. I think I'm going to need to do it again. This is so important because we've seen over and over again how um, the Antichrist is going to be using flatteries. He's going to be using these gimmicks to get people to, to, to like him and to, and to promote him be on his side. But this is also going to be at, um, used against Christians too. And flattery is when someone is just over the top and laying it on thick, you know, saying things where their heart is somewhere else and trying to get your confidence and your trust into thinking, wow, what a great person. And they're, you know, telling you how great you are and everything else. You know, it's, it's, it's more than just a compliment. Compliments are fine. There's nothing wrong with a compliment, but, but flattering is when you're just you're you're laying it on you're laying on so many compliments that it's making them flat. That's that's what flattery is. I mean, you're just 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 weighing a person down with over compliments. And we all need to be aware of this, anyways, in general in your life, because when someone's do, give it, you know using flattery on you, the Bible says they're spreading a net under your feet and they're trying to trick you with something. They're trying to get you to do something that you don't want to do, or they're trying to to use you in a certain way. When they flatter you. That's why the Bible talks about the adulteress that flatters with her lips. Where she's, she's going after men and trying to flatter them. And, oh, you're so great. Oh, you know, all this other stuff to get, to get the man to commit adultery with her. That's what's, that's what's done. And that's the truth. And it doesn't have to be fornication or adultery. It could be anything. When someone's trying to flatter, watch out for flatteries. It says, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Verse number 35, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the, end, to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. And we see that the Antichrist in power here, he doesn't regard God of his fathers, says not even the desire of women or any God. He doesn't care about anybody or anything but himself. And he's going to magnify himself above all. Now, I hear that. Does that mean he's going to be a homo? I don't know. It might. I mean, he's, he's, he's a reprobate. We know, we know that he's a, you know, he's a satanic devil worshiper, so why wouldn't he be a homo? I don't know. But I, I kind of tend to think that he's just, he's just saying, like, there's not a God. There's not a woman. There's nobody 
that's going to influence or change his mind. Like he's just puffing himself up so high that nobody's going to have that power. Because some people, you know, they don't believe in God. They don't believe in the authority of God. But like they might be smitten or stricken with a woman that just kind of has the little bit of power over them because they, they love that, that woman so much or that they're so impacted by, by that, you know, relationship with a woman. But that's not going to be the case for him. He's just, I mean, he's just going to think that he is better than everyone and he's God and everything else. Um, he's going to magnify himself above all. But, I mean, that very well could mean his home. He probably will be. But verse number 38 says, But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. So here we see it's just this God of forces, um, not a real God, obviously, that, that he is, um, that he's going to honor and probably think that that's where he's getting his power from and that's why he's a God and, you know, he might even teach you can become a God too, I don't know. But um, let's wrap this up here. Flip to Daniel chapter 12 is the last place we're going to turn. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verse number 1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even at that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So the same exact reference we see. And you see where I'm saying over and over again, this is talking about the same events. You know, even those different visions in Daniel 8 um, versus Daniel 11 and these different places that we're going to. It's talking about the same events. He's, he's giving us just a little bit more information, a little bit different information about what's going to happen, but it all lines up. And um, we see here again this time of great trouble such as never was since there was a nation even at the same time. Um, almost the exact wording of Matthew 24. Jump down to verse number 8 of Daniel 12. It says, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, a thousand two hundred and ninety days is exactly forty-three months, and forty-three month a month being thirty days, which translates to three years and seven months. Exactly, that's what forty-three months is: three years and seven months. So, from that time that the daily sacrifice is taken away. And remember, in Matthew 24, that's the same time when he says, get out of there. Get out of Dodge. You know, if you, whoever's in the housetop, go. It's at that moment. This is, this is the tipping point. When the daily sacrifice is taken away and the bomb of the nation that make it desolate is set up. This is how much time there's going to be. And he says in verse 12, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. So an extra 40 days. Um, or 45 days it says that they're blessed because I, I believe that that's when um, when Christ will be coming back but um, that's kind of a long time it has three years of persecutions and great tribulation and all these things happen and I think that it'll probably ramp up over time I think that's one of those things like it's going to get started. He's like, okay, it's time, it's time to go. And it's just going to get worse and worse and worse um, as more things become implemented that the Antichrist has in store. Now, we went through a lot of the book of Daniel. There's other places in the Bible that, that talk about end times prophecy. But one of the points I want to drive home is just we saw from Revelation and from 2 Thessalonians and from Matthew 24, a lot, it's a lot clearer. There's a, there's a lot more 
knowledge that could be gained there. But then we could pick up some extra details when we go back to Daniel. We can see some more, some more truth, and now we know how to apply it after looking at Revelation. Now, um, you know, again, this wasn't the most exciting sermon, but we need, we need to know it. We need to know as much as possible about what's going to be happening so that we are prepared. And you can see these things happening. We went to a, to a funeral at a United Methodist Church, and you can see the apostasy going on, and you can see how things are coming together worldwide of, of how people, because you would think, like some people say, well, wait, I still don't think that that one world religion, like people aren't going to buy that because people have strong faiths and strong belief in what, you know, in, in whether it's Islam or, you know, Buddhism or whatever it is. Like some people just have these really strong faiths. Like I don't see them changing that. The world's a change in my friends because that was true for a long time. But even Christians aren't very strong on their faith anymore. And I'm sorry, when we went to that, I was telling you that story, when I went to that funeral to honor a relative, and it was at this United Methodist Church, which is completely wicked anyways. They had this, this, um, this flyer on the wall of an event they were doing. It was called a, a Tri-Faith something or another, where they were saying, learn how others worship. And they had a Jewish rabbi, a Muslim imam and someone representing Christianity all getting together and talking about how they worship God. And they want to focus on all of their similarities so that we can all work together and, and coexist, right? I mean, that's like their goal. And is, yeah, we'll over yeah, we have some differences, but we can overlook that. And I mean, that's just nuts. Yeah, it is. The Bible says, first of all, learn not the way of the heathen. We're not supposed to be learning the way these other people worship. But I just, I just bring that up because there's, it, it's happening. It's happening right now. That's the mo you know, like one of the most liberal denominations. They have the, the women, lesbian pastors up and you know, running the show and stuff in these United Methodist churches. So, I mean, they're, they're way apostatized. But the, the bar is getting shifted. And the more wicked and liberal these, these churches are getting, the more they're, they're getting ecumenical and just, and just saying, you know, have this big umbrella, have everybody together and join hands and we can all just, just celebrate our, our likenesses and our similarities. I mean, the Mormons are out there doing it. They're, they're science fiction religion they don't ever want to talk about anymore. They just want to talk about, well, we're the same because of this and this and this. And when you try to even bring up the, the multiple gods and universes and Kolob and everything else that they believe in, they don't even want to admit it. Because all they want to focus on is the similarities. It's like they're ashamed of their own religion. And that's how, that's how a lot of people are going. They don't have these strong convictions. They're, they're going to be willing to accept anything. And with the pre-tribulation rapture lie that's being uh, promoted so much, even through Hollywood, you're going to have people thinking that Jesus Christ is coming before the Antichrist, mm -hmm. which is just going to set them up yeah. to receive the Antichrist as Jesus. Okay. Because that's what he's going to proclaim to be, is Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's going to proclaim to be God. And guess what? You were waiting for Jesus to come back. He's going to say, here I am. Mm -hmm. Just like every other, every false religion has the imam, the, you know, whoever. There's, uh, there's, there's prophetic figures in all these different religions that are all going to receive the Antichrist. But we know the truth. We have the Bible, we read it, we have God's Word, and I'm looking forward to the day where we can do some great exploits for the name of God, but we have to be strong and we have to be prepared. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for the warnings that you give us, Lord. We know that they're going to help us when we know in advance what's going to happen to keep us strengthened, dear Lord, that we wouldn't get discouraged, that we wouldn't get down, that we could just maintain our hope and our faith because as we start to go through... Uh, the Great Tribulation will know that, that you've already foretold that it's going to happen, and we know how it ends. Lord, we know that you'll, you will end up coming back, and we'll set everything right, and we'll be a just judge, dear Lord, and we're looking forward to that, to that day of your glorious return. And um, we love you, dear Lord, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.